It is 4.20 exactly. And the room goes mostly quiet. Hooray. Excellent. Um, at this point in a day at a conference, I usually ask people to stand up and jump up and down. But if I remember rightly, if we do that here, it will sound like you're machine gunning me to death because of the way these seats work. So instead, um, I don't want you to get up. Um, have any of you seen the musical Return to the Forbidden Planet? No? OK, it's Shakespeare's forgotten rock and roll masterpiece slash sci-fi. It's the Tempest set in outer space. And at one point, they have to reverse the polarity. And the polarity reversal procedure goes like this. Everyone has to put their hands on their heads, go like this, and then go, boo! OK, that was the rehearsal. Yeah, we're going to do it properly now, OK? This is just so that you've got some energy, because uh, there's a lot of code to follow. And I tend to talk very quickly when I have far more material than time, which is the case. OK, so ready? And push harder, push harder, and Right. OK, I have fooled you into uh, revealing that you are capable of making noise. Um, I was at Kathleen's talk earlier on, which was fantastic, but there were no questions, pretty much no questions. Um, you will all do better if any of you starts asking questions, OK? Are any of my regular hecklers here? I have a question. What's the question? So the T-shirt the says Code Like a Girl. Um, this was a T-shirt that was recommended to me by someone on Twitter after they'd seen me wearing a he for she T-shirt. Um, basically, I am phenomenally keen on diversity in tech. Um, I was very pleased to see the NDC speaker list this year was you know, getting better and better. Um, I'm frankly still disappointed in the attendee ratios. I think we can do a lot, of, a lot better. Um, the more diverse. Our tech community is the better the ideas will be. Do you want to work with the best tools, the best libraries, the best ideas that you possibly can? Of course you do. That won't happen if half the world isn't in the room. Um, and then you've got uh, you know, other forms of discrimination as well. So this is uh, to give the message that, hey, code like a girl, because there's nothing wrong with that. OK? Um, cool. That may be the earliest into a talk I've ever received applause. Hooray. OK. Um, so it sounds like I don't have any particularly regular hecklers. Um, if I could ask you to reverse heckle, as it were, um, if any of you were in uh, Damon Edwards and um, David Fowler's talk earlier on, they blamed Barry Dorans when something went wrong. I thought this was a, a thoroughly good model to follow. So any problems I have, if it doesn't compile, blame Barry Dorans. He's blow dart on Twitter. He won't mind at all, OK? I promise. Um, right. More seriously, the worse I present this, the better it is for me, in a way, because I'm currently writing the fourth edition of C Sharp in depth. Um, and please buy the book, basically. It will go into everything I'm going into in a lot more detail. I'm nearly finished on the C Sharp 7 features, and it's at sort of 110 pages just of C Sharp features. I cannot read 110 pages worth of book out loud in an hour. So clearly, there's more in the book than in this talk. But it's kind of the same general picture. Um, and yeah, there's discount code. If you use the discount code CTWNDCOSLO17, it's 40% off all Manning books, or you could buy many copies of my book. OK? <laughs> um, right. How many of you already have Visual Studio 2017 installed? This is very good. For years, I think I gave talks on async for three years in a row at NDC. And the first year, it was kind of reasonable that no one had played with it yet. But by the second, no one had played with it. And by the third year, sort of half the people have played with it. Um, so at least you can all use C Sharp 7. Hooray! You can't necessarily use all the features if you're targeting older versions of the framework and don't want to include extra dependencies. I will try to remember to bring in, uh, to explain extra dependencies as they come up. Um, how many of you are actively, knowingly using C Sharp 7 features already? Far fewer. OK, so you have the tools, but not the knowledge. Um, this is probably the ideal situation for me to hopefully give you some knowledge. This is what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we probably won't talk about all of it, because there's huge amounts. I will point out two things. In fact, I'll reorder things. Um, two things that you probably don't care about. 
Oh, yeah. Uh, whoever's doing screen, could you? Uh, yeah, I'm definitely. I'm down here. This will be a really, really difficult talk without anything on the monitor. Um, dum dum dum. Okay, there we go. Right. So yeah. Um, so this makes more sense. So if you if you didn't catch it earlier, below Dart is the person to blame. Okay. Um, but if it's if it's good, then it's all me. Okay. Right, so this is what we'll be talking about. I'm going to mention these now because I probably won't have time later on. Ref local and ref return are things that will let you do more performant code, particularly if you're working with large structs. Um, I don't particularly expect to ever use it other than for talks like this. Um, if you're a Unity dev or someone dealing with large mutable structs because it's for some reason suitable in the code base you're working on, and you want to deal with them efficiently, then that's for you. Good luck. Um, and custom async return types, um, you kind of don't need to know about the language feature here because the ASP.NET Core has, uh, team has built the one custom async return type you will need, which is value task of t. Um, the, the cool stuff is that you can define your own um, something task of t, foo task of t, and write factories and things. Um, but basically, you can have an async method that returns value task of t, and value task is a value type, as you'd expect. It's really efficient if most of the time the task will already have been completed. Okay? I could probably spend, if I you know, researched it properly, I could probably spend a whole talk talking about custom async return types. Instead, uh, almost no one will need to know the language details. So we'll concentrate on this section. Let's start with tuples. Tuples are a way of uh, composing values where you can't be bothered to write your own type, basically. You know, previously, if you want to have uh, something composing an x value and a y value, you've kind of declared your own point class or point struct or whatever. You could have used system.tuple, um, but that sucks. It sucks because, A, it's a class, so you, know, you just want these things that live together to live together in a simple way. And you know, if, if it's just a pair of ints, do you really want to create an object that's going to have more overhead than the pair of ints? And probably even the reference, assuming a 64-bit CLR, is the same size as the pair of ints would be. Wouldn't it be nice just to have a pair of ints? Well, tuples let you do that. Um, I'll give some sort of guidance later on. But basically, they are to do with smushing together things with no encapsulation at all. And that's both a good thing and a bad thing. Who can tell me the, the sort of golden rules of value types? Anyone, please shout out. Uh, so copy by value is sort of what happens. Uh, there was a, a guideline over there. It, immutable or mutable? Mutable. See, no, no. no. <laughs> You never write a mutable value type. They're always immutable um, because mutable value types are evil. Um, likewise, you know, when you've got fields, do you make your fields private or public? You know, do you use properties to encapsulate your fields or just expose the fields to the, the world? Protect it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no. Just private. Always private. You never have public fields. You never have mutable value types unless you're a value tuple. OK, so um, the language feature of tuples revolves around a CLR type called system.valuetuple, which is in a NuGet package called system.valuetuple, um, version 4.3.0 for whatever reason. Goodness knows what happened to 1.0, et cetera. Um, it's mutable. It has public fields. But it's OK. I'll explain to you later why it's OK. Let's have a look at some tuples. So uh, tuples, as well as uh, being value types, um, so better than system.tuple, um, they have language support, language syntax support. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking about them. So let's have a look at uh, tuple construction. That's a tuple, a tuple of ints, as I was saying about before. So it has two fields, item one and item two. Um, and so this would print out one and two. And this, this code is, if I wrote it like that, equivalent to this. 
This is the C Sharp compiler just converting this tuple literal into a call to a constructor. But don't forget, this is still a value tuple, value type, so it's still sitting on the stack. Um, if I put that back to long and make that 2L, it's still OK. Um, I will say I could do um, int long tuple 1 equals 1, 2. You might be expecting that to construct a tuple of int int, you know, if that were the type of the, the literal, and then convert it somehow to a tuple of int long. But the compiler's smarter than that. It says, well, you've got a tuple literal. You're trying to convert it to an int long tuple. Um, I will just do the right thing for you. So the compiler does nice things to uh, be efficient. OK. These are nasty old like system dot tuple forms. It becomes significantly nicer when you give tuple elements names. So here we have a tuple literal where we have A and B. So you know, we, we name tuple elements in the same way as we name arguments within a tuple literal. So remember, a tuple literal is like an integer literal or like a string literal. It's what you can do to sort of hard code, I'm building a tuple now. Likewise, you can define a tuple type. Um, if you don't want to use var, you can give names within the tuple type. So sort of as if it's like a parameter list. So if you think of that looks like an argument list, this looks like a parameter list. Um, it's, it's slightly a shame that we can't actually call methods passing a tuple that corresponds to the argument list. Um, it would be a, a nice sort of duality, but we can't. Um, so we have tuples, have elements. They have fields of item 1, item 2, item 3, et cetera, up to 7. Um, there are eight value tuple um, generic overloads, as it were. And we've got this idea of a tuple type. And uh, that can have named parameters, named elements as well. A and B don't actually exist. They are an idea in the mind of the compiler and of you. What I mean is they're like Java generics. If any of you have used Java generics, you should know that an array list of string at execution time is just an array list. Well, likewise, a tuple of int and long is just, sorry, a tuple of long a int b is just tuple of long int at execution time. Okay? That's the only way things could work because we have one set of tuple types. If I were to do, you know, one of the alternatives to tuple types is to use anonymous types. Um, that has the benefits of you get names, which you don't with system.tuple, but it has the downside of, oh, then it's, it's on the heap. It's um, a, a whole object, and you can't pass it between methods and things. I'll show you using methods in a minute. Um, so I could have done var uh, anon equals new a equals 1, b equals 2. And that's fine. Um, but that creates a whole new type, an internal type that the compiler is constructing for us. And that doesn't happen with tuples. Every tuple you need is already in the system.value tuple DLL. Um, it's generic, and you'll get different generic instantiations, as it were, but that's a slightly different matter. But that does mean that these, these names can't exist at execution time. The compiler converts any time that I use A here, well, not on the anonymous type. If I use tuple.a, uh, tuple4.a, if I look at this with ILDASM, it will be using item 1. Okay, so it's just compiler magic, but it's really useful compiler magic. And it's useful because um, it's fairly obvious what, what happens within a single method. But what about if I call, um, so if I call a method that returns a tuple? Let's do um, sum and uh, let's do min and max. 
So as an example of where you might want to do this, we're going to have some integers, uh, values 1, 2, 5, 10, minus 3, whatever. And I can get them in easily. You know, I can do int min equals values dot min, int max equals values dot max. And that's fine, but that's evaluated. Uh, it's run over that sequence twice. And that's not good. Wouldn't it be nicer if I could do int min, int max, min max, uh, i enumerable uh, int. These can be generic, of course, um, values. And I'm going to do uh, for each um, var iterator equals values dot get enumerator. Um, and if we don't have any, uh, we'll throw an exception. We'd throw a proper exception normally. But otherwise, we're going to start with, um, let's call it tump min equals iterator.current and tump max equals iterator.current. I started on this for there's a reason why names are good, but I'm kind of going to be evolving this example to show a bunch of things. So you know, listen for everything, not just the names are good. Um, and we can do uh, while uh, iterator.move next. Um, to min equals math.min. Uh, sorry, to max, fine. Uh, and iterator.current. And to min equals no. <sighs> See, it just screws everything up when it doesn't type what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> blame Barry. Um, right, and then after that, I can return. And earlier, when we used a tuple literal, we always had one, two, and they were constant values. They don't have to be constants. It's fine. You can do tump min, tump max. OK, and then let's print out. Uh, instead of having these two method calls, we'll have var min max equals min max. Did I call it min and max? No, min max values. OK, uh, how about we make it static so I can actually call it. And then we can do console.write line uh, min min max dot. What have I got? I've got min. I, I don't have to remember whether item one is the minimum or item two. Because imagine if this were um, somewhere else entirely, it would be confusing. So names are so, so important. And we'll see in a minute just how important the language team believes them to be. Let's just prove that this works, or find the bug that we can blame blow dot for. Uh, what, what did I call it? Min and max. Right, minimum of minus 3 and maximum of 10. Uh, apologies to those near the back if that's hard to read. Um, it would take too long to fix. So yeah, a min of minus 3 and a max of 10 looks kind of good. Right, so, so far, we've proved that the names here are also available here. This is a really good thing. And at this point, we've already blown past what you can do with anonymous types. Because you can't return an anonymous type from a method. Because how would you declare it? You put the name, and it's anonymous. It doesn't have a name. Mm, it's kind of the problem. Um, so this is why this exists, really. Um, now, what if we'd done that? That sort of. Imagine that you've got uh, lots of lines of code. You know you're meant to return a tuple, but you know, you've got loads of stuff. Uh. Well, you can put the tuple um, names in the literal as well. So max is temp max, min is temp min. And suddenly, the compiler at least gives you a little warning, saying, well, it's actually saying, I'm ignoring it. You're allowed to do that. Um, but by the way, you're giving a different tuple element name to the one that I'm about to return. 
So this is one of those things that it's a warning you almost certainly want to take note of. And it goes away if you use the right values, the right names. So this is a really good way when you're using tuples, um, you can do this to make sure that you never return the wrong thing. However, I said that tuples are mutable value types. So why aren't we just, you know, why have we got two variables here? Let's have one variable that's a bag of variables. How about we have var min max equals min iterator.current max iterator.current. And now we can say, instead of having two assignments, we can have a single assignment that says our new value is math.min of min max.min and iterator.current. Do you know what? Let's have a little local current equals iterator.current. And the second element is math.max. min max dot max current. I'm going to undo in a sec because I want to demonstrate something different. And now we can just return min max. OK. So I said I was going to use the fact that these are mutable value types. I've now failed to do so. What I should have done is go via a, sec a second step, which you know, we can make it the, the third step. That's fine. We can just mutate a bit of. You know, we're, we're changing both of the variables within this tuple. So it kind of, I prefer changing the whole thing in one step. But these are all basically equivalent. So this is a good way of saying we had two variables. And this is how I want you to be thinking about tuples. We had two variables, but they're related to each other. We haven't really got encapsulation, but we're sort of pretending that we have temporarily. We're associating them together. We could easily have um, some other tuples representing other things. You know, we might have sum and count. Those kind of belong together. and. You know, we could smush them into one tuple of four things or two tuples of two. It's fine. They are bags of variables while they're variables. So the min max variable is a bag of variables. The value we're returning is a bag of values. So think of a tuple as a bag with stuff in. And when I think about um, variables in general, I think of them as like pieces of paper, a piece of paper with a value and a name and a type. And a tuple is like having two of those pieces of paper. And instead of each of them having their own separate type, sorry, separate piece of paper, we're sort of joining the pieces together and saying, this as a whole is one thing that's got an overall name. And each bit of it can also have names, but they're optional. Um, even though they are optional, I would personally recommend that you almost always use them. If you find yourself using item one and item two, then Think about, would your code not be clearer to read if you did have names? There are some other interesting things. Let's, let's talk a little bit more about names and types. Um, I've mentioned that there's system.valueTuple. And the way to think about the various types is that there are language types and there are CLR types. And the language types are different types. Uh, but they, there's an identity conversion between different tuple types that only differ by element names, or where there's an uh, element-wise implicit conversion. Sorry, there's. A, let me show. <laughs> it's really easy to get this very slightly wrong, and I really don't want to. So um, we can have an implicit conversion from any tuple type to another tuple type where there's an element-wise implicit conversion. So there's, um, in this case, I'm showing from tuple literals, but it could be if I created a whole tuple. So if I have um, 
if our int tuple equals 10 to, OK, uh, let's even make it clearer. L long, long, long tuple equals int tuple. OK, this is an implicit conversion because there's an implicit conversion from int to long and from this int to this long. And it can be a user-defined implicit conversion as well. So for example, we can go from a pair of names that are strings to a pair of namespaces that are x namespace because there's an implicit conversion from string to x namespace. So that's an implicit conversion, but it does say I'm taking these values and making a new bag of values. Okay? There's also an identity conversion. And identity conversions are not new. Um, they've existed for various things around covariance um, and also between dynamic and object. So just as you could have a, a dictionary of object dynamic, foo equals new uh, dictionary dynamic object, OK? You don't want to, but you could. Um, fingers crossed. Yes, that's fine. Um, you could do this between two tuple types, two language tuple types, where the element types are the same, but the names can be different. And the way to remember this is an identity conversion is one that the CLR has no idea about. So when I do this, as far as the CLR is concerned, it will create a dictionary of object to object because dynamic doesn't exist in the CLR's mind. So an identity conversion is one where if you ask at runtime, you can't tell the difference. And that's where the fact that there is only system.valueTuple and it doesn't know whether you originally had element names or not, that's why there's an identity conversion. So anywhere in the language that requires an identity conversion, we'll see it. However, there's this one weird anomaly, which I think was probably a good idea and would have been an even better idea if they'd thought of it like 15 years ago, um, which is in terms of overrides. So the names are preserved for, well, we saw calling a method. You could be calling a method in a different assembly, and the names would still come across because they're preserved in attributes. And I'm not going to go into the details of how the attributes work, but basically uh, that works for return values and parameters. You know, even though a value of system.valueTuple doesn't have the names at execution time, the metadata in the class still knows what it was meant to be. And the compiler insists that if you're overriding something, you don't start changing the names. So even though I can do tuple, uh, tuple original and tuple override, OK, that's OK. Even though it can screw up um, uh, if, you, if you specify argument names, um, it can screw things up. I'm allowed to do that. What I can't do is this. So the error message is tuple names and override derived dot foo int a int b cannot change tuple element names when overriding inherited member. So this is, this is kind of weird. This is C sharp being stricter about something that is sort of a figment of our imagination um, than it is with stuff that's rather more concrete and available via normal reflection and that the CLR knows about. OK, uh, in the interest of time, because wow, halfway, um, I would like to move off tuples. Does anybody have any questions about tuples before I do? Yes. Will the name uh, give the right name in reflection? No. So if you were to get tuple override as a parameter, uh, sorry, as a, the member info, parameter info, um, and ask for its type, it will give you system.valueTuple. If you ask for the attributes applied to that parameter info, you will find something that is tuple element names or something like that. So you can reconstruct it via reflection, 
but you would have to be doing so yourself. And it gets hairy when there are more than eight parameters. That, ah, right. So can I get, so you're saying, could I do, let's, uh, tuple fields, um, no. Right. So if I do here, t1.getType.getField x, that will say, no, that doesn't exist. Item 1 and item 2 will exist, but x does not. Um, because it's the same t1.getType equals t2.getType. They are the exact same type, which is system.valuetuple int int. Okay, so there's no way that they could have different things. I mean, they could have built it that way, and you'd have horrible type aliasing between assemblies and all kinds of nasty stuff, and it would be much more expensive in terms of loading so many more types. This is a definite pros and cons thing. Um, maybe if tuples have been seen to be important way, way ago, maybe the CLR could have its own knowledge of them and have some sort of lightweight kind of just-in-time thing, but no. Um, and that's why it's, it's really important to understand this is what the language knows about and what I'll see when I'm writing source code, and this is what's available at execution time. Um, in particular, that's one of the nice things, I think, about named types. If I'm just wanting to do some diagnostics, I will stick in a named type, dump it out to the console, and it comes up with property name equals property value, and that's lovely. Um, value tuple does have, it does equals, it does um, structural comparison, it does override to string, but it can only give you item one, item two. In fact, it doesn't bother showing item one, item two. It just puts the values in a comma-separated list. Um, there was one other thing I was going to give, which was some guidance around using tuples, uh, which is don't put them in your public APIs yet. Okay, They're new. Certainly, I'm still figuring out where it makes sense to use them. And my guess is other people will be too. Um, they offer no encapsulation at all. So if you create a class to represent this thing I'm returning to you, you can add extra properties to that class later on. If you, return, if you say you're returning a tuple, that's exactly what you're returning. And people will be able to mutate stuff. And it destroys a bunch of encapsulation things. It's really a shorthand for, I can't be bothered to encapsulate this. That's a good thing, because the, the effort of encapsulating something and writing tests, and it goes on, um, is time that you could be spent doing something else. But you don't want to pay the price for not doing it by exposing it publicly. So I would personally say keep it internal for the moment. You know, within one class, if you decide later on to encapsulate stuff as a, as a class, then that's going to be easy. Within a whole assembly, it's going to be slightly trickier, but, but still feasible. Um, but if your code has escaped to other people, then it's going to be much, much harder. OK. Let's talk about deconstruction. So, so far I've shown you composing a bag of variables or a bag of values. What about if we want to deconstruct stuff instead? Let's start off by deconstructing what we have first constructed. So, if we look at tuple deconstruction, here we have a method that returns a tuple. Okay, it doesn't matter what our return statement was, I'm just creating a tuple. Previously, let me just show you, know, no deconstruction, var tuple equals create tuple. With deconstruction, we are declaring three different variables in one go. OK, it really is equivalent to this code here, where we get the tuple, and then we deconstruct the A, the B, and the C. You don't have to do it as var like that. You can do um, int a, int b, and let's, for, uh, oh, that's going to be a string, but let's make b a long. And it just says, well, I, I had a tuple with an int in. I can convert int to long. That's fine. No problem. What you can't currently do, but I think they may be planning it for C sharp 7.2, is something like that and do. Partially, I want to assign things, and partially, I want to declare new values. What you can do, if I remember rightly, and I really hope I do, um, let's not bother giving anything values to start with, but you can do, 
I don't want to declare any variables. I just want to do assignments. Yes, no squiggles. So you know, maybe you've got A, B, and C from other things, or maybe you've got default values, or whatever it is. You can assign to all three of them in one go. And that's tuple deconstruction. And that has built-in language support, but that's not the end of deconstruction. Is everyone happy with how one deconstructs tuples? I haven't gone into details of exactly when you would want to. Uh, I will let you figure that out for yourself, because yeah, there's a lot of features to go through. But everyone happy with the idea of, we took something that was about the simplest way of composing things that you can have, which is a tuple, and we extracted from it either three new variables or three new values for existing variables. Everyone happy? OK. We can go from that to deconstructing um, other things. So let's have a look at this deconstructible class. So here we've got three properties and two deconstruct methods. Okay, so deconstruct becomes a special name. It's not a keyword or even a, a contextual keyword. It's a special name in the same way that get enumerator and get awaiter are. If you have a deconstruct method that is void and only has out parameters and is accessible and is non generic for complicated reasons, then you can use it for deconstruction. So if I create a deconstructable, and I can give it a message and an X, th these are just regular properties, I can deconstruct that to code a message. This is assigning to existing variables. Um, here we've got new variables. And note how I can deconstruct two different ways. I've got two deconstruct methods, and I can use overload resolution or rather the compiler can use overload resolution to just say, hey, I'll, I'll get some extra, some new um, variables. And that's just regular um, deconstruct, sorry, regular overload resolution. You may be wondering why these are out parameters rather than why doesn't the deconstruct method just return a tuple? Well, imagine if we wanted to do this Suppose we had, suppose it was called tuple deconstruct. We could do public tuple deconstruct um, int x int uh, string message. And let's just return uh, x message. And sorry, bump. This looks really weird the first time you you look at it, OK? Because it looks like I've got the parameter list at the wrong place, which is what I, you know, I was falling into the trap myself. This is not a parameter list. This is a return type. Does it look like a return type? No, it looks like a parameter list. That's a tuple return type. If I'd just done it as int string, it might have looked more like a return type, but then it would have been kind of harder to use. Um, but if I now try to do int x string message exception error, tuple deconstruct. Anyone see what the problem is going to be? Pardon? Overload on return type. I heard it. Was that you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so you can't do that. You're not allowed to overload just by return type. Whereas if you've got out parameters, it's all good. Um, I would just like to point out, because I keep on thinking, oh, I wonder if I can. No, that's a stupid idea. You can't do, if I've got deconstructable d equals, let's just copy this. If you do var d2 equals d and think, I would like to deconstruct and have d2.x, d2. No, this is just a regular assignment. This isn't going to do deconstruction. Every so often I think, oh, can't I just use var? No, it clearly just isn't going to work because that would be a regular assignment. OK, uh, so this is doing exactly the same thing as before um, with tuples, but in this case with our own custom classes. What if we wanted to do it with somebody else's classes? Now, I'm a date time geek, 
So naturally, when I start thinking examples, date time immediately comes to mind. But I think it's kind of reasonable that we may well want to deconstruct a date type of some description, and we'll use system.datetime for the moment. Um, in reality, of course, all of you would use node time, right? But if you, if you have to use system.datetime for some reason, wouldn't it be nice if you could just say, I just want to get the year, month, and day out? And that's clearly the order in which it should deconstruct. And we can. Because I mentioned that deconstruct was a special name like get a waiter, and that's exactly the same. Joe, I have actually given uh, my example is for node time. But let's make it date time. And it'll all just compile. Um, and we can just use today equals date time dot today. Uh, darn it. Yeah. No, I need date time there. Um, ah, function key was locked down. That explains lots of things. Um, right. I feel dirty. I need a shower. Use node time. <laughs> OK, um, never use date time dot today. Anyway, you can see the names that I've given here aren't the same names as I've got in here. But you know, the fact that um, I think if I hover over, no, it's not showing me. Um, but we're deconstructing into a year, month, and day. And I'm doing this just by having a deconstruct method as if I created it on the type itself, but it's an extension method. Um, and this is goodness. Uh, there is one downside of deconstruction, which I still don't fully understand. Um, can you see any tuples here in this code? Nope, there are none. If you try to compile this code in a new project that doesn't have a reference to system.value tuple, the compiler will complain at you. You have to have a reference to system.value tuple. If you're not using tuples anywhere, it will happily emit an assembly that doesn't refer to system.value tuple. But as a compiler implementation detail, you need to have a reference to it. I filed the bug. Apparently, it was deliberate. Um, I'm not the only one who finds this annoying. So fingers crossed it might get fixed. Right. So that's deconstruction. Um, just trying to think of uh, the suitable order. Yeah, I think I know where we'll go next. Um, does anyone have any more questions on deconstruction? Nope. OK. Let's talk about out parameters. I seem to have a load of unsaved code. Let's just save everything and hope. Um, sorry, question. Yeah, shout. Ah, yes. Sorry. Well done. Uh, thank you. Um, if you want to deconstruct things, and you don't really care about all the bits. For, for a start, sometimes you should think, is deconstruction appropriate here? Uh, but there's what's called a discard variable of underscore. And it has to be exactly underscore, I think. Let's try double underscore. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 that, that does have a red squiggly. So underscore has become a special name, which means I don't care. I'm explicitly not caring. So here, I'm not allowed to do this. Let's make it slightly clearer. If I do xx and xx again, that doesn't work because that is declaring two variables called xx. And that's not allowed. Whereas I can have as many things as I like out of interest. Does it stop me from being really stupid? OK, this is saying I do not care about anything. I am deconstructing just for the heck of it. Um, may I, you know, maybe. I want the side effects of calling deconstruct because I want to see whether it will throw an exception. Huh? Um, I can't now write. Um, I, no, it, it really does have a squiggle. Sorry. Um, do the squiggles get bigger? They do. Yeah. So you can just about see there is a squiggle under there. Um, it's in the error list. It's fine. Uh, so yeah, at this point, it's not. Um, declaring a variable. And you can possibly see that the underscore itself is in blue, which means you know, sort of keywordy. Um, if you're currently a purchaser, a customer of C Sharp in depth, um, the, the chapter on deconstruction, I think, doesn't refer to this um, because 
there, there was a lot of, is this happening, isn't this happening? Um, and it was only when I watched the build video with Mads Torgerson and Dustin Campbell that I found out it was back in again and had actually made the cut. Um, I had tried something similar. I can't remember with what construct it wasn't working for me. I think you can't do var x equals, can you do it with tuples? Um, 5, 5, 10, can you deconstruct tuples like that? Yeah, that's OK. There was, there was some way in which it wouldn't work. Um, and I happened to hit that and thought that discards had gone entirely. OK, so um, the way that deconstruction is actually implemented, and the reason that generics don't work with it, um, is because it uses another feature called out parameters or out variables. Um, if, like me, you have always been really annoyed at having to declare a variable so that you could then use it in a call to, say, datetime.tryparse, fear not, it is now OK. You can declare out variables in line. So this is how we used to call int.tryparse. And this is how we can do it now. OK. Um, now, one of, the, one of the reasons that this used to be annoying was generally, if int.tryparse failed, you don't want value 1 still in scope. It's going to have the default value. We're kind of not interested anymore. Um, so there was some discussion about should the out variable declared here only be sort of inside the scope of the if itself. Um, for various reasons that basically, I think, dropped out as soon as they tried to use this feature. Um, it doesn't. It still has the same scope as before, so we could use value 2 you know, all the way down here, and that's fine. Um, it will be uh, definitely assigned. Let me show you an example where things might not be definitely assigned. So if um, int.tryparse uh, 5, let's call it out in live 1 for live coding, and int.tryparse 6 out int live two, okay, within here, we can, I don't care about the order, we can use both live one and live two. Out here, we can still do live two equals 10, so the variable still exists and is in scope, but if we try just printing live two instead, we can't because it's not definitely assigned. I'm hoping everyone is familiar with what definite assignment means. It's basically, can you read the local variable? Has the compiler checked that every way that you could get through to here will have assigned a value? And that's exactly what's wrong here. Live 1, that's fine. We've definitely called int.tryparse, so live 1 is definitely assigned. But we might not have called the second tryparse, in which case live 2 won't have been initialized. Within here, we know that we will only get to the body of the if statement if both of these conditions are true. And evaluating that second condition does initialize live2. Therefore, live2 is definitely assigned. OK? Yes? Indeed. Because, uh, and there we go. Uh, so now live2 is not definitely assigned. Um, of course, if you do live2 equals 10, you know, that's pointless, but it is a regular variable. So you can assign to it afterwards, um, but it won't. Uh, rules of definite assignment, they do the right thing. Just be aware that the scope of live1 is the whole thing. OK, let's move on. How long have I got? 10 minutes. Oh, my word. Um, <laughs> There's no way we can do pattern matching and local functions in 10 minutes. Right. Quickest demonstration of pattern matching at, uh, ever. So going from out variables being introduced with um, you're calling a method with an out parameter, you can declare the variable right in the method call. A similar sort of pattern is this. So. This is sort of broadly like if x is int, int i equals int x. So you can use this for um, 
anywhere that you were previously using as and saying, oh, if it's not null, I'll do this, um, you can use is as well, um, is with a variable. So this, this is a pattern. Um, and again, this declares i, uh, I believe. So i is, again, unassigned here because it won't be assigned anything if x isn't an integer. But it does have, um, it is still in scope. So we can do i equals 10, for example. That's one example of a pattern. Patterns are a new feature in C-sharp 7 which hasn't yet come to full fruition. It hasn't yet blossomed. It is a sapling with some interesting shoots, as it were. There are two places you can use um, patterns. One is with if exp uh, sorry, is expressions. And they don't have to be in um, if, I hope. I believe you can do bool uh, was an int equals x is int foo. Yes. Um, but at this point, it's kind of pointless because I can't use foo because it's not definitely assigned. Um, I can see whether the pattern matched or not. So, but my point is it's not specific to if. You could certainly do while x is int foo. Um, but it's part of the is construct. The other place you can use these is in switch cases. And in switch case, we have this additional idea of um, a when guard clause. So the kinds of pattern that exist, so there are two places you can use them. And I'll go into a little bit more detail about switch case in a minute. So you can use them for is expressions, and you can use them for switch case. And I suspect that may be the only places you'll be able to use them for a little bit. But that's the idea of those are places you can use any pattern. So far, there are three kinds of pattern. One is the um, type matching pattern that we've seen, this int i. That's a pattern that matches if the, the, the candidate, whatever we want to call it, the test value is an int, and it declares a variable called i. The second kind of pattern is a constant pattern that just says, is it equal to a constant? Okay. It also has to match the right, um, the right type. So that can be object, x is 5. It will only work if x is an int 32 of 5. If you pass a box long, this will print false. Or rather, it won't print, yes, x is 5. And the third type of pattern that I haven't um, shown here, uh, x is var v. Nope, var v. Uh, v is v. That's a pattern that always matches, and it declares a new variable of that type. Sorry, of um, it declares a new variable which is implicitly de defined to be the same type as x. So in this case, it's just object. Um, and you may be wondering why why bother having a pattern that introduces another variable that looks exactly the same as our previous variable. Well, we might not have had a variable because we might have been doing if you know, some complicated method. Or we could be switching on some complicated method. And in an if statement, it's pointless. OK, I'm going to kill this example again. In a switch case, it can be important because you can then use the variable where maybe you wouldn't have had a variable before. Or we could do case var o when um, o dot get type uh, or is value type, for example. So we've got a guard clause here. So this is the, the second place you can use pattern matching is within switch case statements. Now, there are two ways you can think to yourself about how switch statements work. And both will work for you. It's fine. Use whichever you find better. One is, I've got a switch case statement that's only got constants. It's an old school switch statement. 
and I've got new style, new school switch statements which have patterns in, and they're entirely different kind of switch statements. That works as a model. Or you can say every switch statement ever has patterns. If I only had, uh, so if I had static void old school int x switch x, um, case 3, and then something, and then case 10. You know, this looks exactly the same as the previous thing. 3 is a pattern. It's a constant pattern that only matches the value 3. So every previous switch statement is a pattern switch statement. So if that's an easier model for you to think about, then fine. It is worth being aware that suddenly order matters in switch statements. It hasn't usually previously mattered, um, barring weird scoping things. But here, they're tested in order. So the compiler will do some optimizations. If you have multiple constants, and it can do so, it can do some optimizations in the same way that it used to. However, um, otherwise, it will look one at a time and say, well, is the value of five, uh, x 5? No? OK, let's see whether it's an odd number. OK, it wasn't odd. Is it still an integer? Yes, it is. Therefore, I will return something. Otherwise, keep going down. So it's very much like an if, else, if, else, if, else. However, you should be thinking to yourself, this feels more like all those F-sharp talks that I went to and swore afterwards that I was about to learn F-sharp and nearly got as far as buying the book. And then I remembered all the previous times that I bought the book and never actually read it. Yeah, you've all, all been there, all seen those, the, the pattern matching in F-sharp and thought, that's really beautiful. I should really get around to learning that sometime. Um, well, this is C-sharp's sort of way of getting a little bit into that. I expect currently Switch is still a statement um, you can't implement a whole method by saying, well, here's a bunch of cases. That might come. And it's definitely the way to start thinking about it is, well, I can react to a number of different situations. I will make each of those situations a case pattern. That works really, really well. OK, am I already over time? No, I have three minutes to show you local functions very, very quickly. Um, let me just see the agenda, make sure there isn't anything more. OK, numeric literals. You can use binary. You can use underscores within numeric literals. Right, that was that feature done. Um, <laughs> throw expressions in certain places. Um, and I won't say exactly where, because I'd have to remember it. You can use throw as if it's an expression instead of a statement. So for example, in the null conditional, uh, sorry, the null coalescing operator, you can say, well, either return value or throw an exception. In the regular conditional ternary operator, uh, it's the conditional operator, damn it, happens to be ternary, um, then you can say, well, if we get as far as the bottom, throw an exception. Um, and there's another case that I can't remember offhand, I think. Uh, but yeah, oh, you could just throw an exception anyway. You know, my new way of doing, I want to write a method that's unimplemented, is to use an expression body member and just throw an, ex uh, an ex throw an exception. You couldn't do this in C-sharp 6 because it wasn't an expression. And strangely enough, an expression body member has to have a body that is an expression. Now it's an expression. Hooray. Right. Local functions. I've only got five examples for this. I'm sure it won't take more than two minutes. Um, <laughs> you can write methods within methods. OK? Um, it's as simple as that. So here we have a fib method that calls itself. So you couldn't do this just with a delegate called fib, because then, well, you could. You'd declare it and assign a null value to it, then assign a lambda expression, which could call fib. And that would be horrible. This is a method. Um, it can call itself. Um, you can, so that's, that's the other equivalent. Let's see whether we have something that captures a variable. Um, no, that's just a, an example. Right, here we go. Um, like Lambda expressions, local methods can capture state from the surrounding context. So they can act as closures. However, they're really interesting. If you had uh, this, sorry, no, if, ba, 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 no. If you implemented this as a Lambda expression, so suppose I had action 
increment and print i equals uh, nothing goes to stuff kill the local method. OK, in order to implement that, the compiler would generate a new class. And in the main method, it would create an instance of that class. And that class would have a field called i in it. And it would do all kinds of stuff. And the reason is, by the time it's created a delegate from it, that delegate could still live after the main method has finished. However, think about when I've got just a local method. Unless I capture that, that method somehow, and I can do that, like this, you know, method group conversion, there is no way that this method is going to increment, uh, sorry, is going to be um, executed using that i variable after main has completed. Or imagine it's not a main method, but something that can be called several times. Each time you call the method, you get a new variable, and you know that there will be no way that that method, will, uh, the, the nested method, will execute and need to use that same variable by the time it's finished. So it can do it all on the stack. This time, it will still generate a new type, but it will be a struct, a mutable struct, again. Um, and it will generate a magic um, ref um, generated struct. struct uh, Oh. ST, let's call it. And it will do ST.I++ and ST.I. And then it will do generated struct ST equals new generated struct. Not that this exists at the moment, but you know the compiler would generate it. Um, ST.I equals 10. And then it would do ref ST. OK. What's the cool thing about that? Everything's still on the stack. That has not generated a single new object. And because the struct only has the same number of fields as we had local variables in scope, it's only taken the same amount of space on the stack as it would have done before. It's very cool. Final thing to note on local functions, as I am two minutes over already, is you can refer to local variables that are deeply nested within a method. but your local method then has to be deeply nested as well. So this is declaring a, a method within a for loop. Now, obviously, that's not actually going to you know, create a new object for the method on each iteration. It will create some things on each iteration. Um, but at that point, it's OK to refer to this j variable that's new. I can't do this out here. Because J doesn't exist. That will, in a sec, there we go, uh, give me an error. So you can only refer to variables when they're in scope. You can only refer to them uh, if the call is right. Um, I can refer to them here because J has been declared. It has to be after the declaration for no particularly obvious reason. But even though j is not definitely assigned at the start of the method, by the time we actually call the local method, it is definitely assigned. So that's OK. And the compiler makes sure that everything works. Right. Um, that is all I have time for. I don't want to make you late for your next sessions. Um, as you can spot, there's a lot in C Sharp 7. The general theme, whereas you know, C Sharp 5 was all about async, C Sharp 4 was all about dynamic, C Sharp 3 was all link and things, C Sharp 7, a bit like C Sharp 6, was, will kind of make the world a bit better. Um, we will make your code easier to read. We will give you tool sets for expressing yourself more clearly. Uh, this is no bad thing. Great ideas, you know, huge ideas are good, but a lot of little improvements that let you express yourself better and more clearly and more concisely are also good too. Um, much more detail in C Sharp Mid and Depth, the book. There's loads of detail in blog posts as well. Um, so there's plenty of room to experiment. I hope, if nothing else, all of you who stuck your hand up saying, I've got Visual Studio 2017, but I'm not knowingly using C Sharp 7, hopefully you will all go back to your hotel room tonight and start 
just playing. You will learn far, far more by playing than you can possibly do by listening to me. I'm John Skeet. Thank you very much.